and I'm sure you've all heard the saying about pulling yourself up by your bootstrap, but if you don't have any boots to begin with, where does that leave you? Are we living up to our values? Does everyone have a chance to succeed? Is everyone able to have a good quality of life regardless of race or income? Are we living up to the values that we just talked about? Everyone who looks at Denver's skyline can see from the amount of cranes at work, more and more buildings mean more and more companies are moving here. And Denver and Colorado are growing as quickly as any city and state in the country. With so much economic growth and expansion, we should be seeing that improved quality of life. Yet, when we look at the data, we see that economic growth isn't translating into prosperity and better quality of life for everyone. And that's especially true for Colorado, Blacks, and Latinx, immigrant, and indigenous communities. When we think of things that contribute prosperity and the quality of life, a lot of different things come to mind. Maybe it's a good doctor, um, hospital, or public transportation system for people to get to and from work a library or park where your kids can learn and play. For many of us, it starts with education. A good education seems to be the key to unlocking income and economic stability. It also happens to be a fundamental responsibility of our government to provide every child an education. A good education and a college degree are the foundation for good quality of life later on. Like being able to make more money, being able to choose a job that you want, and many other things. So how are we doing in Colorado on providing educational opportunity for our kids, especially kids of color? All children can achieve. Resources required, required for teachers and schools to adapt teaching styles and practices to meet the needs of students. Without adequate resources, including experienced teachers, schools cannot make the individualized choices needed for students to do their best. Now, as we see, um, let's see, Nicole, could you go back to this right here? So we see where Colorado ranks. We rank 41st in the state, 44th when it comes to the math gap, 39th when it comes to the reading gap. But let's talk about the teacher wave competitiveness. We are 51st. are still coming out of pocket every day to provide for your children. I have a very good teacher friend who before COVID hit has already come up, she had already spent $1,500 in her classroom to help her students. So let's sit with that for a minute. When we make cuts to K-12, that means everyone is trying to do more with less everyone from school board to superintendents and principals to educators and support staff are being asked to find ways to close the opportunity gaps but with less money and more students than they had a decade ago these limited resources contribute to the inequitable results that we see in colorado schools today okay can we go back to can we go back um, to, let's see, go a little further, go up one more, one more. There we go, right here, there we go. So let's talk about higher ed. I know there's some teachers in the, there's some college teachers out here in the room. And when we make cuts to higher education, it means college becomes more unaffordable for families. Now in Colorado, four year completion rates for black students is about half of that of whites. The numbers are slightly better for Latinx students, but still there's a 12% point lower than whites. Nationally, black students are especially affected by student loan debt. They're more likely to have a college debt, carry more debt, and take longer to pay it off, meaning that they end up paying more over time than white students. Okay. Unfortunately, there are additional barriers to a good quality of life, depending on the color of your skin and how much money you or your family makes. 
a lot of this is based in historical oppression and expressed in systemic racism. This isn't right. We need to do a better job of making sure opportunity is there for everyone. And the rules about how we pay to remove these barriers are in our tax codes. Coloradoans have drastically changed our tax policy at the tax ballot. We did it once before, we can do it again. In fact, we must do it again because the rules that establish who pays and how much they pay are powerful tools in shaping the economic opportunity and can be used to dismantle systemic racism. Now, before we get into Colorado's tax code, racial disparities didn't just happen by accident, right? We, and we're gonna do some, a little deep, deeper dive into that being the case. So before we get into Colorado's tax code, we need to look at the roots of some of these tax policies that we see across the country. Now, after the Civil War, lawmakers driven by desires, des, uh, desired root, desires rooted in white supremacy designed policies like tax limitations to help white landowners pay less in taxes by shifting the burden onto black communities. Many of these are now embedded in state laws across the country. Take a look at what happened in Alabama. Here we have an example of creating a policy intended to specifically protect white homeowners. Property tax limitations and laws designed to prevent taxes from going up are rooted in those explicitly racist policies designed to protect one wealthier group by shifting costs onto other communities. So when voters passed Gallagher in 82 and Tabor in 92, they were unknowingly passing policies rooted in racism. They also ended up making the racial inequities in our states worse. But what's the story today? Who benefits the most or the least from property tax limitation? We got here because the policies that were created by people, elected officials and voters. In Colorado, we put a lot of our tax rules in the constitution. Tabor and Gallagher are two of the laws that come up most often. Gallagher limits the amount homeowners pay in property tax and Tabor makes it harder to raise taxes and keep taxes low for people with high incomes. Let's look at how property tax limits deepen racial inequities. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at this graph here. All right. How many of you are renters? Raise your hand high. And how many of you have had your rent go down? <laughs> and nobody's raising their hand. Okay. Well, our property tax limitations mean property owners are paying lower taxes. Of course, that doesn't mean that the renters are paying less, meaning that folks with established wealth in the form of other homes are paying less, while people without this wealth is paying, are paying more. The data shows people who own their homes are more likely to be white. In fact, the only racial demographic above the state average are whites. Black Coloradoans are the least likely to own their own home. And let's talk about what freedoms, are, um, what freedoms do ownership, home ownership have. Well, the equity in your home allows for families to start a business, send their children to college, switch jobs, buy more property, get through financial hits such as car repairs, leaky roofs, and medical emergencies, and the list can go on. What are some of the reasons for this? First and foremost, people of color, and you, I know the data is out there, Ben, you probably want to put this in there in the chat, chat for us. People of color, especially black people, are more likely to be turned down for loans. They are also more likely to pay higher interest rates. I have heard story after story after story listening to this, and it just, it just boggles the mind how this is a continued practice. Goods versus services. High income earners tend to purchase more services than low income folks. Taken another way, people who earn low incomes tend to buy more goods and services. The tax rates on these two types of purchases are dramatically different. You don't pay sales tax if your housekeeper comes to clean your house, but you do pay sales tax if you buy cleaning supplies to clean your own home. Business owners are paying sales taxes too. And though they may pass the tax, the cost onto the customer, the public doesn't benefit on the second sale. 
Part of the reason for this is because sales tax are naturally regressive. Families who earn lower incomes spend a larger chunk of their money on things that are subject to sales tax. And those at the top tend to spend more money on services other, and other things that aren't subject to sales tax. So how do we fix this? Usually it's through a fair income tax with higher rates for higher incomes. You might pay less in sales tax, but it evens out because you end up paying a higher income tax rate. Again, unfortunately, this is specifically prohibited under the Colorado Constitution. So we're stuck with this upside down and equitable tax code unless we amend our Constitution. So now we've traveled to Alabama in 1932 all the way up to Colorado 2020, nearly 100 years later. And we are still talking about this tax system that doesn't counterbalance the negative effects of sales tax. And who benefits? Well, people with higher incomes. So this is the end result of all those tax policy decisions made by voters and elected officials. The wealthiest pay lower state and local tax rates than the rest of us. So not only are we underfunding the public investments that create opportunity for individuals and families, but the way we pay for these investments and in contributing to these very inequality that we see that we're seeing made worse for lack of opportunity for all it's a vicious cycle and it's made worse by our state constitution which specifically makes it more difficult to address these inequities here is another look at colorado's regressive upside down tax code the more money you make the lower tax you pay this is all taxpayers all races And are there better ways to do this? Now, our tax code might be rooted in, in a racist policies and has the effect of deepening racial inequities, but we can use the tax code to undo some of the past harm done by racism. So yes, we can do better. If income is racially inequitable, then the best way to address the situation is a fair income tax and taxes higher income at a higher rate. Colorado currently has a flat income tax, which makes our system more upside down due to tax loopholes that favor the rich who are disproportionately white and our reliance on regressive taxes rooted in explicitly racist history. Luckily, we have Carol Hedges here to talk more about our fair tax Colorado at 271 in just a moment. So hold on guys, she's coming. So we can make fundamental changes. Changing our tax code isn't the end of this issue. It's the beginning of the solution. Just like the policy got us here, it's going to take policy to bring about more and just an equitable system. But, it's, it, but if we have enough money to help make sure our education system is funded equitably and college is affordable, it will be a start. And it starts right now with you by taking ownership over our future. We can start to heal the wounds of the past. We can use the tools of oppression and injustice to bring about liberation and finally start to see the liberty and justice for all. And here to talk more about Fair Tax Colorado and Initiative 271, it's Carol Hedges. She is the executive director of the Colorado Fiscal Institute. Woo! <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes, Lee. Love you. I'm so impressed by the, um, you know, Lee has talked about the program that um, she participated in, and we called it our ambassadors program because we're looking for everyone from lots of folks from lots of different places to be able to share the information about not only um, the history of where, how our tax code came to be, and not only about the inequities that it's resulted in, but also about the important ways that we can change it. And I want to give a, you know, a virtual round of applause um, to uh, Lee for doing such a darn great job. I'm going to clap a little hand here um, because of the excellent job she did in laying out what the basics are of, the, uh, uh, of what, how we got here. Um, I don't know how many of you um, have, have had an opportunity to read Ibrahim Kendi's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
Um, but I heard, I had the uh, privilege of hearing uh, Professor Kendi speak a few week, months ago now, um, back when we all got to go to places. Remember, do you guys remember what that was like when we were actually like in the same place with other human beings? Um, and one of the things he said that really spoke to me um, as he talked about this concept of being an anti-racist is that, you know, he said that sometimes people think that policy isn't about racism. And what he says it said, and if you haven't read the book, I recommend that you might want to check it out, is that it is policy that is at the heart, it is what causes racism. It is the indoctrination or the inclusion of policy decisions into the way we conduct ourselves that is it, it is the definition of racism. And there is no um, more clear way that that's demonstrated than in how we collect and use the revenue um, that government, um, uh, you know, that, that, that we collect through taxes. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about some opportunities we have. I just want to illuminate and build on some of the things that Lee said. So I'm going to repeat some of her slides. I mean, they're kind of great, I think, because some of them she got from us and we share them and that's what this movement is all about. But I want to talk a little bit about this idea of raising money for collective investments that, that lead to opportunity. And then we're going to talk about some uh, steps to undo structural right racism in our tax code. So I'm uh, I just want to take a minute on this slide um, because it's there's something really powerful here and, and I think it's worth repeating and I know Lee talked about this and and I, I intentionally you know that the crack staff at Great Ed said you know Carol you're gonna be talking about the same thing Lee was talking about and it's like yeah I know but but this is the stuff I mean this is the this is the meat so my experience in talking about taxes is, you know, somebody once told me you needed to hear things seven times before you actually got it. So for those of you who are just hearing this a few times, I'm going to, I, I want to come back to this because this is so important. What this, what this chart shows you is that folks that um, uh, make the least in our state pay the high, contribute the highest percentage of their income to supporting public services. So that's education and transportation and higher ed and, and um, human services and clean air and clean water and all of the stuff, free and fair elections, all of the stuff that we collectively buy with tax dollars, folks at the lower income categories and lower income contribute more of their income every year to those activities than folks at the higher income. Let's go to the next slide. This is another one that Lee talked about, um, and I and 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 one of the things she she didn't spend a little, as much time on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be beating this one to death, is that um, but I want to talk about this one. This is sales taxes, okay? So as we all know, um, well, at least the nerds among us know um, that that where tax revenue, where the money that the state collects comes from, income taxes comes from sales taxes, and it comes from um, insurance premiums taxes, primarily. That makes up the general fund. We also collect money through fees, which we're not going to spend as much time on today. But, but, but in Colorado, we, spend, we, we get some of our money from the income tax, but we also get a lot of money from sales taxes. And Lee did a great job of talking about how sales taxes are regressive. And what we mean by regressive, as Lee said, is that that means that lower income folks pay a higher percentage. Look at that. For um, folks in the lowest 20% um, uh, of all uh, wage earners in Col or uh, income earners in Colorado, they pay 6.1% of their income in sales taxes. But the top 1%, pay less than 1% of their income in sales. Lee did such a great job of talking about why, I'm not gonna get into that, but I want you to hold this in your mind as we go through the next few slides, because this doesn't happen by accident, it happens because of the policies that we choose to adopt. Can we go to the third slide, please? The question here is, are there better ways to do it? And I'm really, you know, of course there are. Um, and I want to put up an example. Will you go to the next one, please? 
that this is the state of Vermont. Now, I'm not here to say that the state of Vermont is the, has the perfect tax code, because of course they don't. They have their own quirks. And one of the unique things about the way we do things in, in the United States is that each state gets to design its own sort of approach when it comes to taxes. But one of the things that's striking about the way Vermont does things is that you will notice that consistently it is the top five, the top 5% of wage earners, those earning the most, pay the highest percentage of their income in taxes. So that's a system where you have a whole lot more equity as we're going to be talking about as we go forward. So of course there are better ways to do it. And luckily in Colorado, there are things we can do right now that can make our tax code end up having the impacts more like the Vermont tax code than where we are today. Can we go to the next slide, please? We know, and, and, and um, Lee laid this out beautifully, that what we need to do is to change our tax code to rely more on high income earners and the way to do that is a graduated income tax. How many of you, let's, let me just see a few, uh, few hands here. How many of you know what a graduated income tax is? All right, so maybe I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time. Everybody I could see, I saw a lot of hands, um, but, but, but just to, to be honest, some people say, well, does that mean we just gradually have to pay more and more and more on taxes? No, 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 that's not exactly it, right? What a graduated income tax is, is that the tax rate increases as income increases. So in Colorado, we have what's called a single rate income tax, where all income, no matter how much you make, if you make $30,000 or $30 million a year, your income is taxed at the same rate. It's 4.63%. A graduated income tax would say that the first percentage of your income of everybody's income would be taxed at the same rate. And let's just say the first $100,000 would all be taxed at the same rate. And then the second $100,000 for people who make more than 100,000 would be taxed at an increased rate. And then the third $100,000 for people who make more than $200,000 would be taxed at a higher rate. How many of you have heard the, we have, there's a lot of myths you know, in taxes. Have I have ever heard anybody say, oh, you don't want to do that because it's going to put you in a higher tax bracket. How many of you have ever heard that comment, right? Well, that implies that if you're, if you are making $1 more than, so in the example I'm giving, if you're making $101, that implies, or $100,001, that implies that all of your income would be taxed at that higher rate, but that's not the way graduated income taxes work. If you're making $101,000, the first $100,000 is taxed at the first rate, and then that $1 is taxed at the higher rate. We'll be coming back to that concept, but it's really important for people to understand that because of the way that graduated income tax works, it ends up grabbing a little more resources from higher income folks as a way to offset the impact of the sales tax that tends to grab more from low income wage earners. Let's go to the next slide. There are some things we can do, right? And you know, you guys didn't come on there thinking that we were going to talk about this and not have a solution. I know that. And luckily, to Initiative 271 is a great next step in trying to improve um, the uh, equity in our tax code. Let's go to the next slide, please. So hopefully most of you have seen this slide or seen this um, breakdown before. Um, but what um, Initiative 271 is, which is, it does, and remember 271 is an initiative that a group of citizens Many of you on this call have worked together to put on the ballot, and you may or may not have thought of it as a way to reduce racial inequity when you were thinking about it the first time or when you were weighing in or when you were talking to people who were weighing in about what we should do, uh, be doing to fix uh, funding for our schools. But it is really at the heart of not only generating additional money, but also making the code more racially 
equitable at the same time. So what 271 does is it strikes a provision in the Colorado Constitution that requires that all income be taxed at the same rate. Remember how Lee talked about the voters had adopted all these constitutional things, not necessarily with a racist, like an intentional racist outcome in mind, but the point is that's where we are. And so we've got to undo that stuff. That provision that says you have to tax all income at the same rate uh, means that, well, we'll talk about what it means in a minute. I'm going to show you something in a minute. It talks about it. So the first thing that it does is it strikes out all the require the requirement that all income taxes be taxed at all income be taxed at the same rate, and it creates a statutory graduated income tax. It lowers the income tax rate from 4.63 percent to 4.58 percent on the first $250,000 of everybody's income. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're making more than two, you know, less than $250,000. That's your own business. We all know my mom taught me a lot of things. And one of them was you're not supposed to talk about your income and money in public, right? So here I am talking about income and money in public. But for the Legislative Council has told us that by lowering that income rate on the first $250,000 of taxable income, 97% of Coloradans will get a tax cut if, pro if Initiative 271 is passed. That means there will be more money in individuals' pockets to help pay rent, to save for that home, to um, pay for their college, uh, to the kids, their, col their kids' college education, to pay for their own college debt or, you know, whatever, pay for health care. I even think they, you know, my, who knows, some people may even use it to go someplace and have a little fun. What a heck of a deal. But it'll be a little more money in, in, in the pockets of 97% of all Coloradans. Now for income, be, for, for folks who earn income above $250,000, whatever amount they earn above 250, but below 500,000, will be taxed at 7%. For the individuals who make more than $500,000 a year, the first 250 is taxed at 4.58, the second 250 is, packed, is taxed at seven, and any money above 500,000 is taxed at 7.75%. And then for the, the small number of Coloradans who actually earn in excess of a million dollars, their first 250 is taxed, 250,000 is taxed at 4.58, the second 250 at seven, the third 250 at 7.75, and any money above a million dollars, any income above a million dollars is taxed at 8.9%. This process, this new tax code that raises taxes on less than 3% of the population is designed and uh, was estimated pre-COVID to raise $1.97 billion. Whoa, right? Just think about the kind of opportunity, the kinds of problems we could solve in the state of Colorado if our elected officials had access to allocating more equitably an additional $2 billion. Okay, let's go to the next slide if you wouldn't mind. So what it does, we, you know, we believe, we, I think most of us believe this is structural reform that can, that can change racially biased outcomes. Colorado has those racially biased outcomes. We need a fairer tax. It's a tax cut for, I said 97, we've been rounding to 95 before uh, we just most recently got this uh, estimate from Ledge Council. So I'm gonna talk about is 95 for the rest of the time that we know it's gonna remedy the problem that Colorado's middle class pays a higher percentage of their income in uh, taxes than do the top 5%. And it, this fair tax lowers the, rate, the tax rate paid by most Coloradans while at the same time increasing funding for public services. That sounds like a much more equitable system. That's what Fair Tax Colorado will do. Let's talk now about how it makes the tax code specifically the impact of how it makes it more equitable. Let's go to the next slide. 
So you guys have seen this slide now. Let's read it a third time. You only need to see it seven times before it's intuitive to you. So, you know, like two more times through this and we'll get you, get you. But remember what this slide shows is that folks at the lower income categories pay a higher percentage of their income in taxes, state and local taxes. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is the one, this is the slide where I ask all of you to take a deep breath and channel your inner nerd, okay? You know when you were sitting in a class at some point in your, in your education history, you know, your experience, and you find it's like, aha, I finally will understand what they're talking about in that chart. My goal is to stay on this chart until I explain it in a way that everybody understands what it says. So we might be here all night, folks. So let's see if we can all focus on this thing and get it figured out. So if you look at the, 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 the takeaway from this slide is in the title. People of color, Black Coloradans and Latinx Coloradans are overrepresented in the income categories that pay the higher share of state and local taxes. Okay? Y'all with me? You understand? Give me a nod, Lee. You got me? Okay? Renee, I can see you. Annalise, you got it? You understand what that, what, where we are? Excellent. Let me tell you how this slide works because it's really powerful. If you look at the first three bars where it says total, that shows you the demographic breakout of population, racial breakout of population in the state of Colorado. 75% of all Coloradans are white, 2% are black, and 16% of taxpayers are Latinx um, taxpayers. Okay, that makes sense. So if we distributed income equitably across all categories, it would look exactly like the first three bars. But guess what? It doesn't. If you look at the second three bars, where it says on the, on the bottom, it says lowest 20%, you see that the blue bar is below the blue dotted line of 75%, right? And the gray bar is above the line for, um, uh, which was, means that Hispanic voters or Latinx voters are more, there's more of them, there's, they, rep, they make up a higher percentage of the people in the lowest 20% than they represent in the total population. This slide is looking a little funky for some reason, somehow in translation, but you will notice that it should show that for the um, black, black taxpayers, it's the same situation. They are overrepresented in that first, that lowest category. Let's go to the second category. Yeah, this is, something's funky has happened. So now I'm just going to tell you how complicated this slide was. And now it's really complicated because it doesn't look exactly right. So let's ignore those lines. You're just going to have to trust me and I'm going to send you a copy that doesn't look funky like this. In the categories of the lowest 20, the middle 20, um, Black voters are overrepresented in those categories compared to their racial popula their, 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 their share of the total population. Latinx voters are overrepresented in those um, categories as compared to their share of the total population. And white voters are underrepresented. But when you move to the top 20, the top 15, the next four and the next one, it all switches around. White voters, white taxpayers are overrepresented and black and Latinx voters, taxpayers are underrepresented. In fact, in the top 1%, there are so few black taxpayers earning in the top 1% of income in Colorado that they don't round to a half a percent. There's something wrong this is the outcome that tells us our current system has embedded racist policies in it, and we need to fix that. 
Um, so let's go to the next slide. If 271 passes, the, the uh, provision that we, I just explained to you, it's going to help. It doesn't completely solve the problem, but it's going to help. It is going to mean that the top 1% will suddenly be paying a higher percentage of their total income in state and local taxes than any other group, which gets us looking a heck of a lot more like that Vermont example. And we also, while we don't get the, the, the design doesn't get the top five and the, top, and the 15 quite up, it makes progress in making the tax code more equitable. Does that make sense to folks? Can I just stop there and get some thumbs up or some questions or? or hey, Carol, we actually, we do have a few questions in the chat, if you wouldn't mind me uh, directing them your way. Please do. <clears throat> okay, so I will read from the bottom up. Um, so from Tannis, we have a question. Uh, the first line of the ballot initiative says, shall state taxes be increased uh, $2 billion by an amendment to the Constitution? Uh, do you think voters will read beyond that to see how this initiative benefits them? I think they will if we ask them to. Right? So what my experience, Tannis, is in, and in, in, um, um, this is why we're going to be asking you to get involved, right? Is that most people have their mind made up about what they're going to do before they ever sit down to fill out their ballot. We, it is our obligation to help as many people as we can understand that, that, that while it says it's going to raise $2 billion, it's not coming from you. Not one cent of that is coming from you if you make less than $250,000 a year. I will say parenthetically, I don't know if this is on the uh, on the on tonight or not, um, but I will say that she's one of my uh, she's she's one of my heroes, Lisa Wild, the, the director at um, Great Education Colorado, and she talks about that language um, that you see as the first sentence of that uh, proposal as that language that's required by the Tabor Amendment that shouts at you, right? It's in caps, it's in bold. And it is designed specifically, Tannis, to make sure that people don't read beyond it. Because, you know, you read $2 billion and you say, well, I can't afford that, right? That's why it is so important that, and, and it's why this campaign for this two, for 271 has been built on an effort to educate folks so that they don't have to rely on that language, but know from talking to us and or to you or whoever that, uh, this that that how it's going to affect them, and if they make less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, they're in the ninety-seven percent of Coloradans who will actually see a reduction in their taxes. Other questions you Great. want me to handle? We have another one. Um, it says, "Can we cite the data or find the data for that ninety-seven percent figure?" Um, and that's sort of another question too. I thought it was 95% of Coloradans would get a tax cut. Can we use the 97? So can we use the 97 and then also, uh, is that data available somewhere? Yes, you can use the 97. We've been using 95 because that was the best estimate that we had at the time. Um, and the where that 97% data comes from and where you can find it is in the draft of the blue book for 271. It legislative council, um, which is the group that makes all the fiscal notes and all that stuff, they're the ones that have looked at the tax code and said 97% of all Coloradans have taxable income of less than $250,000. So we can get a link to the uh, blue book uh, out to everybody so that you can look at that. Great, and then just two more, if you wouldn't mind. So um, is the $250,000 for each individual taxpayer or for a household if filing jointly? It is currently written as uh, for, a, it can be, it will be for a tax, a, a household uh, filing jointly. I will tell you that this is a, this is an issue. And when we were drafting 271, the 40 or 45 person policy team that put it together, spend a lot of time talking about this issue. 
And, um, and let me just explain it to those of you who might not understand what's going on here. So if you're married, um, you have the option, uh, and you're both wage earners uh, or incomers, you have the option of filing jointly or filing singly. Um, there are some advantages to filing jointly, and so most people do. I mean, most married pe people um, file jointly. And some people say, well, that's really unfair because if I was filing singly, so let's take, let's take an example of a couple that makes um, $350,000 jointly, right? And um, one, the, um, oh, I picked a terrible number. Let me do 300. I have to do my math better. So let's say that at $300,000 and one of the uh, members of the, um, uh, one of the couple, one of the members, one of the, folks in the couple, um, makes 260 and the other makes 40, right? So in that case, the person making 40 won't, will have their taxes lowered, but the person making 260 will have to pay the higher rate on $10, on, on $10,000. So the, there's an equity argument that some people make that it should be based on um, it's the, the tax brackets should be adjusted differently so that if you're filing jointly, the number is higher than if you're filing singly. We wrote that language in multiple ways and it was so confusing. We could not figure out how to do it in a, in a um, citizen's initiative that wouldn't cause more confusion. So when 271 passes, and we go back to the legislature and we're talking to them about how to allocate that new money, we could consider changing the tax code, having them work together because that's the way we ought to be making tax policy anyways, their elected officials ought to be doing it, um, that they could work out a way to divide it up, to, get, to raise approximately the same money, but separate it so that you have a slightly different income categories for single uh, tax filers versus joint tax filers, but that's a great question. Okay, and we have we have just uh, two more pretty short ones that I think I can I can sort of roll them in and, and ask them at the same time. So, is that two hundred fifty thousand dollars taxable or gross income? And then the other one is um, I'll just read you the the phrasing itself. Um, the ballot language is a TABOR requirement, right? So yes, the ballot language, the way it's written, the, at least that first sentence that starts out, shall taxes be raised X number of dollars, that is a Tabor requirement. That's the shouting part. So thank you very much, Doug Bruce. Um, on the other question about whether or not it is um, taxable or gross, it is taxable income. And I don't know who asked this question, but thank you, because it's a really, um, it's a really great question. Um, and if, if you're making, so my organization does all kinds of estimates on tax stuff all the time. And we, it, it depends on, it's not, the, the formula I'm about to give you is not exactly the same for every taxpayer. And it's not the same by every taxpayer group. However, for, so, but, but to just to help out a bit, if your taxable income is $250,000, you probably earn about $280,000 or $85,000 in gross income. It's about a 15 to 18 to 20% difference between where your gross income is versus where your taxable income is. And please don't hold me to that because I know one or 10 or all of you could say, well, my income doesn't work out that way. For me, it's 35% different or it's 13% different. It all depends on how many kids you have, whether you itemize deductions, a whole bunch of things. So it is taxable income. So in order to be at a taxable income of more than $250,000, your actual gro uh, gross income is probably gonna be, or not even, gross income, your adjusted income is going to be significantly higher than that. 
Shall we keep going? I think we're good to keep going, Carol. All right, so let's go to 271, helping investing in opportunity. So one of the things 271 does is it makes our tax code fairer. It starts to unwind some of this built-in policies that have resulted in the kind of racial inequities that we see. It gives us an opportunity to do some of that reallocation among ourselves in a way that results in more equity or at least in this case, everybody paying the same share and one group where uh, white taxpayers are particularly overrepresented, they um, will be paying closer to the same share than, um, than other taxpayers. But it raises close to a billion dollars and it allows the state to invest in opportunity. And I wanna go back to some and underscore some of the things Lee said. Education is one of the things that we all understand as a key component of economic success. We are making, we, our current education system is wildly underfunded, wildly underfunded. And that is a particularly difficult situation for kids that come to school not as well prepared, as not as with, with not at the same sort of language acquisition levels. By increasing the amount of money that's available for K-12 education, we now have the ability to make more specialized education, to actually have our teachers spending more time with students, better understanding their unique needs, and making sure that each of those kids has the opportunity to, to achieve the potential that, that every kid has. So 50% of the new money goes to increase funding for recruiting, retaining, paying, and paying teachers and student support professionals. Based upon the pre-COVID estimates, that's close to a billion dollars. Can you imagine what that can do in classrooms all across the state of Colorado? It will allow us to recruit some, recruit the best teachers to fill all the vacant positions and making sure that the folks that are interacting with our kids on a daily basis are of the highest quality and are recognized for the important jobs that they're doing. The other 50%, close to a billion dollars, is given to the legislature and the legislature has authority of what to do with it as long as it's associated with some cost of our growing population and our changing economy. This is one of the places where I think it's fascinating um, post-COVID versus pre-COVID. When we were, when um, the Vision 2020 folks were doing the work to put this proposal together um, back in uh, the fall of 2019, besides funding for schools, the most significant issue raised was the impact of growth and growth in population and sort of the changing nature of employment in our, um, in our economy. You know, folks that were working not for employers where they're getting unemployment insurance paid and they're getting workers comp paid, but sort of what we call the gig economy, right? And so when we wrote this, when this language was written, it was designed to address the two specific issues that were foremost on Coloradans' minds. And I don't think any of that has changed post COVID. In fact, we've laid bare more so than anything I can imagine why we need more resources to deal with the changing economy. Think about it for a while. What is the, what is the economy going to look like coming out of this? We're going to have to do a lot of things. And this will finally give our elected officials the, author, the, the ability to invest in the kind of innovations that we need because it will give them an additional close to a billion dollars to make those investments. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is the COVID impact. In the short term, it's going to help us avoid additional budget cuts. The state is looking at um, cutting about, it, it cut about, it, it, the, the amount of money that was available to spend is about almost $3 billion less than it was two years ago when we adopted the budget. 271 would fill that gap dramatically. While of course, at the same time, giving a tax cut to 95 or 97% of all Coloradans. 
if we don't pass 271, we're going to be looking at another round of deep and broad tax uh, budget cuts. The last set that, that, that are adopted as part of the 21 budget increased um, the negative factor or the uh, budget stabilization factor to over a billion dollars. I've just been out on this around the state talking to folks about and trying to get people to, to sign up and sign petitions on 271 and I was just in two school districts. One was um, uh, Glenwood Springs. Glenwood Springs teachers were just informed that they're going to get a pay cut next year. I was then in Grand Junction. Grand Junction School Board just announced that they're going to have to reduce the school budget by $9 million. And since most of the budget is in school and teacher salaries, we know that we're going to see additional impacts on salaries for educators and, 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 and professionals in those schools. We are already at 51st in the, in the country, literally behind everybody, including Washington, D.C., in the competitiveness of our teacher salaries. That was before we made these huge cuts. And the work that my organization has done tells us that the worst year for budget cuts tend to be not the first year of the recession, but the last year of the recession. And that's why I think it is imperative that we do everything we can to get 271 on the ballot. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is a heavy topic when you start talking about taxes and racism, right? These are like holy mackerel, right? This is, I think I want to make this through this whole presentation. Have I sworn, have I said a swear word yet? I don't think so. I may make it through the whole thing without actually having a swear word. But this is heavy stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. This is heavy stuff, right? And it's, it's stuff that is, um, we can't run from, we can't hide from anymore. We've been able to do it for too long. And racist roots are one thing, but racist outcomes are different. They are caused, as Professor Kendi says, by policy. We have an opportunity in November, if we can get the darn thing qualified for the ballot, to change, to make structural changes that can start to unwind the racially biased outcomes that we see. It can, through structural reform, provide more money to invest in opportunity, which is going to be the key to making long-term structure uh, 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 to, to reversing long-term racially biased outcomes. And the third thing that is so important about it is that when we have those additional dollars, it's going to allow our elected officials the opportunity to make other structural reforms that can result in better equity throughout the system. And I want to stop there for a minute because I know I have a lot of people associated with the education community on this call. We've we also, oh, sorry, Carol. I was going to say we also have some really good questions about the last few slides. I don't know if you want to save those until after your. What's up? Let's go ahead. Let's take those questions. I'll come back to okay. this. Okay. Gotcha. So um, the first one, and I can answer this just because it was clarified further down. Uh, what exactly are student support professionals? Does this include food service workers uh, and custodians? Um, and the answer was yes, support professionals are food service custodians, teachers, aides, et cetera. Um, so anyone who works in the school um, but is not a teacher, does not have a, a teaching license. Um, so what are some of the specifics of that 50% towards um, investments to help offset the costs of a growing economy? Um, and will that be specified for voters in the ballot language? It is not. That is the only specification on, that's the only language in the proposal. It has to be used to offset the cost of a growing population and a changing economy. So the, our elected officials, the people that we elect to make these decisions, are going to get to decide. I would bet that they're going to be making some investments in transportation. I'm going to, because that's certainly impacted by a growing population. I'm thinking that they're going to be making some investments in healthcare. 
because that is a change that's happening uh, right now because of that's something that's happening because of the change in our economy. Fewer and fewer employers are offering health care, which means there are things that the state can do to help make sure that there's more health insurance coverage and making health insurance more affordable for all of us. I'm betting that they're going to spend a little bit of that money on, um, they, they may invest some of it in higher education as well because our economy is changing and what we need from our students, from, the, from our graduates is changing. So though that's the kind of latitude that our elected officials are gonna have. They're gonna have the ability to address the things that we think are important and then we have the ability to hold them accountable if they don't spend that money in the way we want them to through a couple of things in 271. Is one, there's gonna be reports that are gonna report on it every year um, on how the money is spent. And then after nine years, there will be a uh, report to the people um, on the impact. How, what has the impact of this measure been on, on um, the business economy, our investments in public services, um, and a couple of other things that I can't remember right now. So there is no additional specified requirements for how the money be spent. We're actually going to give our elected officials a billion dollars to spend on the things that we tell them are important. And that is probably going to change from one year to the next because who, you know, who would have expected COVID, right? But there needs to be some flexibility to, to address those kinds of things. Anything else? Uh, there's one more here. Um, so, it, so I know I haven't voted for certain amendments, not because they weren't a good idea on the right track, um, but because the specific numbers caused other problems. But the real question is, um, so as you said, the legislature needs to do its work. Um, what will it take to get rid of Tabor sort of in this context? I don't know. Um, I was really hoping that what we would end up with at the end of this a five year process that we've called Vision 2020, I was hoping that where we would end up um, is a recommendation to go to the voters to take Article 10, Section 20, an amendment notice Tabor out of our constitution. Cooler heads prevailed when we looked at polling results. Um, in, even in 2019, um, we have um, a structure of leadership right now that does not instill a lot of confidence in um, Coloradans and voters in our elected officials. Um, I would suggest there's a lot of blurring of federal elected officials and state elected officials, etc. But first, the name of Tabor, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, is a powerful messaging tool. Um, and today, for a lot of people, having rights is really valuable. And when you say you want to repeal a Bill of Rights, people are like, oh, wait a minute, we don't have enough rights already. So they don't think that's a good idea. And all you have to do is say that, you know, this is going to give the authority, you know, that currently elected officials don't have the authority to raise taxes. And this would give them the authority to do that, which is the opposition argument. People immediately connect to a group of electeds that they don't trust. And so the polling on repealing Tabor consistently is below 50%. And um, I don't know. I, I have been working as hard as I, well, maybe not as hard as I can, but as I, I've been working hard um, to try to change the attitudes of people, get people to understand that public investments really do build the thriving communities that we all want to live in. And that if you live in a community that's not getting the resources, it doesn't help to keep taxes low. It helps to have the right elected officials to make sure that they do more equitable work with the money that they have. And when you give them new money, we need to hold them accountable. That's been my work for 20 years. And quite frankly, I've, I, I haven't been very successful. 
because we still text, um, the, the popularity of Tabor still remains um, an insurmountable um, um, barrier to actually having it removed from the Constitution. I wish I had better news. Well, Carol, thank you for all the work you've done on 271, which is an integral part of that whole operation. Um, and I think we are good to um, move on um, with, with the rest of your presentation, Carol. Let me just say, so great, thank you. And I just want to say that many of us have been involved in like conversations about the school finance formula, right? It's inequitable. It doesn't make any sense. It was, it along with Tabor was adopted in the early 90s. What the heck is in the, um, going on right now that is anyway comparable to what was going on or the same as what was going on in the early 90s. But we've also been involved in those conversations. It's like, yes, we would like to change the formula. We'd like to reweight things. And we're all about that as long as my school district doesn't lose money. Right? Because it's fair. Nobody's school district has enough resources. So people want to do the right thing, but it has to be under the current system. It has to be the right thing is as long as you're not cutting what's going on here because we don't have enough either, even though I know that other school district is really in a bad way. By providing additional resources, that means it gives us an opportunity to truly make reforms in allocation systems, policy that is leading to these racially biased outcomes. That is the third and, and, and a critically important component of 271. Let's go to the, I think, now I wanna talk about what we can do. So, we need you, every single one of you, to be carrying a petition. If you're not comfortable asking your neighbors, your family, your friends, or you're not interacting with neighbors or family friends because of the pandemic, then we, and, and, and you, we still need your signature. You can carry a petition. You can find a place to go get a, sign a petition, or we can have someone bring a petition to you masked, gloved, safely to get your signature. All you have to do is visit, thank you, Lee. All you have to do is visit fairtaxcolorado.org and Lee looking fly like she is right now, or maybe Annalise who's looking fly right now is gonna come to your house and let you sign a petition. Better would be, you would say, you know what? In reality, I'm doing socially distanced cocktails with my neighbors anyway. I can ask them. We just need as many signatures as possible. Let me tell you a truth that seems so obvious. With, who is it that finances state ballot elections? It is, the, it is generally people of means. Because you and I can give $200 here or $20 here or even $2,000 here. But when a statewide ballot initiative costs eight, two, five, ten million dollars to run, it is generally individuals of means that lean into whatever the purpose of the uh, initiative is to support it by writing substantial checks. There are a lot of very generous folks in Colorado. There are fewer and fewer of them that the, the pool gets narrower when what you're doing with the money they give you is raising their taxes. I mean, think about it for a minute. You know, that's not irrational behavior. There are generous people. There are generous people on this call who are making substantial contributions to the campaign. But we've known from the beginning that this campaign was going to be a campaign of the people. We were building on the shoulders of the folks who worked so hard, standing on the shoulders of the folks who worked so hard on 73, getting in on the ballot. And then we had the pandemic. It's hard to go collect signatures at the Peonia Cherry Festival if it's not happening. And those were the places where our volunteers went the last time around to get signatures. And as we all know, those events have been closed down. So it's harder. That's why we need everybody. 
The governor came out with an executive order to try to make it easier doing a single rind petition, as you may have noticed a little over a week ago, Colorado Supreme Court said that that single line petition process violated the Colorado Constitution. So we're back to have to do having to do it traditionally. Please visit fairtaxcolorado.org and click on the volunteer button so that you can get involved yourself. Can I have the next slide, please? So there it is, www.fairtaxcolorado.org. There's a million things you can do there. You can calculate whether or not you're going to have to be um, paying more. Um, you can donate, really important. You can endorse and say, this is a heck of an idea. I want my name associated with it. You can request a presentation like this. You can sign a petition. Again, Lee or Annalise will come to your house or some, it might not be them. There are others who are moving around the state, but if you're lucky, you're gonna get Lee or Annalise. And you can also sign up to have a, have a petition sent to you so that you can reach out to your friends, your, so to your neighbors, to the people in your core and pod, you know, we've all got a few people we're hanging out with. Um, so that's what I got. If there are other questions, um, I see a question here. Do you want me to just, Zach, do you want me to just answer some of these questions I'm seeing? Or do you, what, you tell me what I'm supposed to talk about. You can answer any questions you see down there. Um, and then also if we have anybody else who wants to ask you a question, um, you can either speak up or you can write it in the chat and I'll deliver it to Carol. So um, I see one that says, what is our current, how many signatures have we have turned in and, and what do we need? Well, we need 125,000 valid signatures. Um, we're not there. I can't tell you exactly where we are because there's about 3,000 or so petitions still in the field. And so we don't know exactly how many they are, but I will tell you it is a hell of a, it is a hell of a hill we have to climb. I did swear, sorry, Lee, I didn't make it. Um, we need, we need 60,000 signatures, you guys. And, um, we got it. We got. We're gonna have to work hard to get them. We can do it. The enthusiasm level is high. The people that are, you know, more and more people are really beginning to understand this. The more people that we can connect this, the structural racism piece to, the more enthusiasm we can get. In the, I want to tell a little story that in this um, ambassadors program that we participated in, one of the one of the um, class sessions where we spent we spent quite a bit of time talking about like how are taxes thought of in your community. Right? Because what's the cultural myth? Everybody wants to pay less and less taxes, right? That's just like they, they make it so that you can't make ends meet because they compete with other things in your budget. So many times in communities of color, taxes are paid at higher rates, but, you, but folks don't see the benefit coming back to their community. They don't see the equity. They don't see that benefit coming back. And so frequently it's all about avoiding and not paying and taxes are bad. And the more we can talk about our current tax code is bad. It's not that taxes are bad. The way we've built our system is wrong and bad. And not only will we have better outcomes in terms of schools, et cetera, but we will just have more fairness if we change this policy I believe is one of the ways that we're going to get people enthusiastic and we're going to get the signatures that we need. Um, I see someone, Kathy, I don't know who you are, but you said you're going to get petitions and get signatures right on. We love you, Kathy. Heart, big heart to Kathy. Um, uh, other questions that I should be answering? We actually have uh, one or two questions for Lee, um, if that's all right. So, Lee, um, this is from Kitty. Uh, could you please elaborate on um, sort of what's racist about um, those property taxes you were talking about earlier? Um, the, the, I'm sorry, Kitty. Kitty um, the property tax that were racist? Um, goodness, I... Lee, can I, do you want me to step in here for a second? Yeah, yes, would you? Yes. Um, so 
one of the things that Lee was talking about, I thought that was a really important point she made is that we have a tax code, we have a way of making sure that um, residential property taxes stay low. It's called the Gallagher Amendment. And if you remember what she also showed up are the statistics of who does that benefit? When you give property tax relief to homeowners, who benefits most from that? The people who own homes. And who are, who's more likely to own a home in Colorado? A white person. And she also remember, remember when we had the whole thing about raise your hand about if you got a cut in your um, rent? Well, I can, we can tell you over the last 20 years, that owner of that building that you live in, whether it's a home or a high rise or whatever, their property taxes have been going down because the residential assessment rate has been going down, but they're not passing that on to you. That's something that they benefit from. It, it reduces their costs, but rarely, and I literally have never heard any, no one has ever said to me, yeah, you know, my rent went down because my landlord told me their property taxes went down. But that is, those are the two examples that, that Lee lifted up um, that I, I just wanted to underscore. I want to, I want to throw in one other thing there that I think is really fascinating. So um, something I didn't know, maybe many of you did, um, but um, we, um, Lee talked about how it was a, in Alabama legislature that um, adopted the first limitation on property taxes as a way to make sure that white landowners weren't having to pay too much for the education of um, uh, the children of, of uh, uh, recently freed slaves is also, and also lower income, non-landowning white folks too, right? I mean, it was all about protecting themselves and with a particularly racist intent. It's incredible when you go back and do the research and find out sort of, they were very explicit often about it. But the thing I didn't know that is the other part, the corollary of that story is that the requirement for mandatory public education came out of legislatures that were elected immediately following um, the end of the Civil War. Those were legislators that were legislatures in South Carolina and Alabama and Mississippi that for the first time, and in some of them actually had a majority of black uh, members, and they had, came together and said, we know that the way we make it economically is through education. We want our kids and our communities to be able to thrive economically. And the way that's gonna happen is that we have education. And so they required public education. When post-reconstructionist stuff happened, I almost said it again, but I saw you Lee, so I didn't. When that stuff happened, that's when folks said, the, the, the white representatives that took over in majority said, well, wait a minute. We got this requirement that you have to educate everybody, but we don't want to pay for the education of those kids. And so they imposed upon themselves a limitation on how much of their money could be contributed to public education. I just think that is a story that's so powerful um, and one that is the kind of thing that we don't think about when we say, oh, let's keep our property taxes reasonable but it's where it came from. And it's another example of the kinds of reforms and you know, through the Gallagher reform is another way that we could be doing things that will be unwinding some of these racist roots from our, uh, from our tax code. Uh, Carol, we have a question about, um, so are the numbers going to be different because of the COVID losses? Yeah. We haven't seen an estimate yet. Um, Legislative Council's Blue Book doesn't have a dollar amount. Um, my organization is estimating we'll probably see about a 20% reduction. So we'll go from $2 billion to $1.6 or so uh, billion dollars raised in the first year. Um, but if we do that, and that money then gets spent on teachers and, and road construction and all of the things that it will get spent on, we know that's a great economic stimulus. Um, it, it, that's another one of these fascinating things that 
high income individuals tend to save a lot of money. And so they, they don't reinvest it back into the community. It's like, it doesn't go to buy things in the same ways. Some, you know, some people say, well, that's trickle down. Well, we'll have a long argument about trickle down at some other point. But we know that money in the hands of governments gets spent. It gets spent to buy teachers and nurses and um, uh, engineers and road or snow plow drivers, et cetera, et cetera. And that then puts money in the hands of individuals who live in our communities where that they can then take for the, to the local dry cleaner, to the local restaurant, to the local food store, to the local uh, um, car repair place. And that's really what channel, that's what stimulates the economy. You know, this whole COVID thing where, you know, all the money that was coming to in economic payments, the point was we needed to keep the economy moving. We needed people who had lost their jobs needed money so that they could be spending it to keep the economy moving. It, it's, this is sort of like an economic stimulus that will be available um, post COVID, but the numbers generated will be lower um, simply because everybody's going to be making less money, even, you know, rich people too. Well, we are um, nearing the end of our time here. We're approaching 730. Um, so if anybody has any final questions for Carol, um, you can go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for turning out. Um, thank Carol and Lee for uh, their presentations and, and showing us the racist roots of Colorado's tax system and what we can do right now to make sure um, that the racist outcomes of our tax system um, don't have to happen in the future and, and that we'll have a, you know, a more equitable um, future to look forward to for everyone, regardless of the color of their skin. Um, and then there's a, this has been wonderful. How can we support um, fairtaxcolorado.com? You can carry a petition, you can donate, you can find a signing station near you, uh, but fairtaxcolorado.com, that's going to be your hub for everything you need. I appreciate everyone coming out here and uh, logging in. We had over 60 folks joining us on this Zoom call. We will be able to post this video and um, you will be able to share it with whomever you would like. And um, I appreciate everyone who's ready to come on and get a petition. We're ready for you as well. There are a few steps you'll want to know about when you come and get um, a petition, which do, does include just the final turn-in dates and as well as the um, uh, notary uh, requirements as well. So definitely come over. You could uh, DM us, <laughs> uh, slide in the Instagram chat, whatever you need to do, email us. And um, if you have any additional questions, because we could even host another session as well, um, generate it from the questions from this chat or from more questions we get later. And I definitely wanted to highlight some of the takeaways from what you all have typed in as well as what you have asked. So just in the beginning from Lee being able to highlight the extreme uh, disparities for black students and uh, black families from the access to home ownership and the benefits that come from that. Um, and then even from the regressive taxes, a lot of you uh, really, it resonated. I also want you to look into some of the re regressive taxes that have actually been getting signatures on different ballots. So there's more stuff coming on our November um, ballot and that we're gonna have to vote on. So you really wanna stay educated about all of these because um, our initiative 271, Fair Tax Colorado, is, is has a little bit of competition and you want to make sure you're voting for the right thing. So there's other things out there that are just simply tax cuts. But as we see tax cuts, that's we need more solutions and less and not just simply the tax cuts, because our state has been severely impacted by the shutdown. Um, and we have lost a lot of revenue. And with certain limitations, we definitely need to generate revenue that does 
end up back into the education system that we haven't recovered from since 2008. So um, I put in a few links um, that come from CASB and it has highlights from every district in Colorado where you can find your district with in that from that link and it has a, one, a two pager description of how 271 could benefit the that specific district in addition to how much money has not been returned to the education uh, system something that i also just want to leave you with is some food for thought at, in regards to even just how we generate revenue and and for education in general, um, pro based on property taxes in general, we need some major changes. And so um, from the things that you've learned today, from what you could read and the information available on Fair Tax Colorado, as well as our own website, please continue to dig in and question how our nation and our state has built um, a legacy of um, racist uh, and racism and discrimination that has negatively impacted the outcomes for everybody because if our most vulnerable communities are being impacted none of us really are reaching our full potential so definitely keep keep on the good fight thank you for those of you who are questioning your privilege who are reaching out to be um, better allies and remember it's a journey not a race or a marathon but we do have an obligation to ensure that everyone has a certain quality of life and um, that we can all thrive together we're all going to have to hunker down after the impact of the shutdown and so of uh, based on different decisions made by leadership throughout the nation <laughs> so you know we're in this literally together but some of us are still at an advantage that you know we really want to examine so i appreciate you humoring me and just taking some of my chat commentary um if it, <laughs> i left you with the food for thought but also a joke two things we know are guaranteed in life death and taxes, right? <laughs> so we have to have this conversation. Um, taxes have existed since BC, so we, we're going to have to really evaluate where the money is going now. So anyway, on that, I just want to say thank you for everyone who's joined and um, look out for um, our video. Make sure you're following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and that you have signed up online so you can continue to get our emails that have either additional articles or resources that we're sharing to continue uh, spreading information about Fair Tax Colorado and the um, newest um, information on the education forefront. Thanks again. And thank you, Carol. Thank you, Lee, Ben, Nicole, <laughs> Great Ed, Colorado Fiscal Institute, and um, everyone else. Dave Young was on here. We had um, uh, just so many people here just con who have been contributing on the front lines and behind the scenes. So thanks again. And I'll see you in the office.